All right. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you from around the world. My name is Mike Leatham from Kepware. Before we get started, could folks just type into the question pane to verify that you can hear us? All right, so we've got several several yeses, hellos, loud and clear. So all right, we're, we're in good shape. So my name is Mike Leatham. Uh, I'm a senior applications engineer as part of the product management team uh, for PTC, primarily on the Kepware and Edge Connected products. Uh, and I'll let Kevin introduce himself. Yeah, I'm Kevin Nelson. I am the IoT product manager for Advantech BNB SmartWorks, so in charge of a lot of the product direction for the IoT product lines. Fantastic. Uh, and I also just want to mention to everyone, um, if you have any questions at all, um, please go ahead and enter them uh, into the question pane. Um, and we will uh, do our best to pause kind of periodically during the presentation as needed to answer questions. All right, let's get started. Let's see, let's find my mouse here and get started. There we go. Uh, so just a little housekeeping stuff here. So all of you that have signed up, um, which is all of you that are listening, and, and all of the people that are not listening um, will receive an email uh, with a PDF slide deck, uh, as well as a link to the webinar recording. Uh, and the webinar will also be posted uh, both on the Kepware YouTube channel um, as well as the BNB SmartWorks website. So what we're going to talk about today, um, we're going to spend a few minutes introducing Kepware and introducing BNB SmartWorks. Um, this is a little bit of a unique webinar that we've got kind of a cross customer base, if you will. Um, so we'll do our best to explain each other's uh, products and businesses. Feel free to ask questions. Um, I'm sure that there are folks out there that are new to both companies. Um, you know, and I, I suspect Kevin's in the same boat as I am, that uh, I'm frequently presenting to people that are pretty familiar with Kepware. Uh, so we'll uh, do, our, do our best to answer questions there as needed. Uh, and then we're going to talk briefly about MQTT in general. Uh, and, and why it's used in the factory, um, why it seems to be gaining popularity as one of the protocols of choice. Uh, and then we're going to talk about what the BNB wizard platform um, does for us, uh, how it can be used, and then how it can be used with the Kepware MQTT client driver um, in industrial automation. And the thing that didn't make make the agenda, and you know, in my mind, the most exciting piece, uh, is the last thing we'll do is a demo of the whole stack. So briefly, uh, Kepware has been around for a little over 20 years now. Uh, got its start and remains headquarters in Portland, Maine, and really got our start as an OPC server. Um, for those of you that are not familiar with that. We'll spend spend some more time on that uh, this morning. But we are primarily in factories for manufacturing, uh, and we've grown over particularly the last five years uh, into a number of other verticals, uh, including oil and gas, uh, smart cities, um, kind of IT and office. Then over the last couple of years, we've started to get much more into the IoT space, uh, most notably in 2016. Yeah, so it's been just over two years now. Uh, we were acquired by PTC, um, who is a leader in the industrial uh, IoT space. And so we are now part of that larger company. However, the, the Kepware brand continues to, to live on independently. Um, for those of you familiar with KepServer, there are no plans to change that. Uh, so we've been going strong now and, and hope to keep doing that. 
So particularly for those of you uh, on the BNB side that are less familiar with Kepware, I just want to briefly go through what the Kepware's primary product, Kepserver EX, kind of what it's used for, what it does, how we help uh, people in the factory. So we provide 150 different drivers that allow data to be transmitted through a, a number of mediums. I like to think of it as if a translator. So let's say Rockwell, Mitsubishi, Siemens, they all make PLCs and all of those PLCs speak a different language. So just because they have an ethernet port on them doesn't mean that the bits over the wire are the same. And so it turns out that whether it's serial or ethernet or, or whatever, that I can connect my entire factory pretty gracefully, typically with you know ethernet type scenarios, but everything talks a different language. It, it's equivalent to, for those of you that are as old as me or older, uh, when 20 years ago when we bought a new printer, the first thing that happened was you had to grab the CD and install the driver because it may be a USB or you know, or, or a different type connection, um, but different vendors speak different languages. Kepserver does the same thing for industrial automation. So if we look down at that image on the right-hand side, we have what we call southbound connections. So this is where the data comes from. So that might be another OPC server. It might be a flow computer in water, wastewater, oil, and gas. It could be a database, it could be an independent sensor, uh, and PLCs are one of the big ones that we spend a lot of time talking with. And then that is passed up to the server. For those of you unfamiliar with an OPC server, um, the idea behind this is I only want one application asking for data of all of these data sources. Because if I've got, let's say, 10 applications on that top end, the northbound connection. You can see at the top, we've got HMI, SCADA, MES, ERP, another database, um, big data, IoT type stuff. You know, if I've got all of those different applications from across the enterprise hammering on, for example, a PLC, the PLC is spending all of its energy on communicating with those things that want data, as opposed to doing what it's really designed for, which is running a process. And so a OPC server allows us to install it as kind of a middleware, if you will, a communications platform within a factory or you know whatever the setting is, and only ask for that data once, at the fastest rate that anybody needs it, and then serves it up to what in the OPC world are called clients. So all of those northbound uh, connections are OPC, well, OPC clients are historically, now it includes a lot of different things, including IoT protocols. And then on the that blue stuff off to the right, um, we can do some pretty interesting things. Uh, we call these advanced functions, but it allows linking, for example. So can I directly link something between two different PLCs? Um, there's some math functions in there. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of different things that don't strictly follow the data source to client model, uh, and there's some additional functions in there. Right. So Kevin, if you could give us a little introduction to BNB SmartWorks. Sure. Thanks, Mike. Um, so BNB SmartWorks was founded in 1981. Um, you may be more familiar with us, uh, or historically known as BNB Electronics. Um, so you may have used some of our little uh, converters, 232, 422 type stuff. Um, but in the meantime, um, basically we've always been focused on machine-to-machine -machine communications. Uh, and mainly out at the network edge. So we started with those serial type products and eventually moved into uh, things like uh, 
Ethernet infrastructure, um, wireless technologies, eventually like Wi-Fi, cellular, uh, Bluetooth, and also with the acquisition of IMC products, I uh, got into a lot of fiber converters. Um, the big thing is we were purchased by Advantech then in 2016. Um, which brings the advantage of the backing of a $1.4 billion company. Um, so we see a lot of growth potential, a lot of investment coming forward. And what we bring to the table, um, we think we bring the largest product line breadth with the addition of Advantech. Um, you may know Advantech from industrial PCs, um, but there are a lot of different edge solutions, a lot of different technologies, uh, a lot of different applications that we think we bring to the table. Um, we have a long history of application experience, uh, being around more than 30 years in energy, oil and gas, utilities, water, um, quite a few manufacturing, uh, manufacturing facilities. Um, we have um, some great ways to get started with some IoT solution kits to prove ROI up front before you go on further. And we have a full service capability, um, worldwide market in support for our products uh, so we can remain consistent across the world and, uh, and have local support for everything. Fantastic. Thanks, Kevin. All right, let's spend a little time talking about MQTT. So what is MQTT? Um, it's the most important piece of it is that it's lightweight. Um, it, it has very little communications overhead. Uh, it's used for a wide variety of things, but our, the thing that it's used for of interest to us uh, today is there's a number of IoT devices and industrial automation devices that are pretty rapidly adopting MQTT. Um, so, so I guess let's talk about that specific to industry. So we're going to be talking about sensor networks through a gateway today. That's explicitly what the BNB SmartWorks wizard platform is. Uh, so we'll talk about that quite a bit. We're also starting to see MQTT used some uh, natively inside PLCs. Uh, you know, this is probably not the protocol you would want to use for pushing, you know, several tens of thousands of updates at a high rate of speed, like you might in a traditional large PLC. Uh, but for a smaller PLC, uh, where I'm sending slower, lower volume of updates, MQTT is a pretty attractive protocol to use. So let's let's dig in a little bit here about how MQTT works. So the publish subscribe method is probably the most important piece. It's not, you'll often refer to it as a pub sub protocol. Uh, let's take a look at what that means. So in the middle between the subscriber and the publisher is a broker. Uh, you, you'll see this will be confusing for well, really for everybody. If you're familiar with MQTT, this will be confusing. And if you're unfamiliar with MQTT, it'll be confusing because there's two names. Uh, so historically, uh, it's been the broker in the middle. In the latest version of the spec, 3.11, that's been out for about a year now, six months to a year, um, it is now called the server. So on one side of the server, we have the publisher of data. So on our previous example, that might be that PLC or that sensor gateway. It's going to publish to a topic. And then a subscriber can subscribe to that topic. So, you know, an example I like to use that everybody can get their head around is let's say I had a basic home automation system set up in my house. And so I might have topics and subtopics that looked like Mike's house, Mike's living room, lights in Mike's living room. And so all of those are various 
subtopics that I can access with the MQTT spec. And so down at that lowest level, let's say I have three lights that I can control and monitor down in my living room. And, you know, maybe I've got sensors for, you know, maybe I've got a Boolean of, is it on and off? Maybe I've got a brightness sensor, you know, what is the total brightness in there? Um, and maybe I've got some fault detection on, you know, the incoming electricity or something. But it can get much more interesting than that. So I can have many publishers publishing through a broker. I can have publishers that go to one or many topics. And likewise, on the subscriber side, I can have I can subscribe to one or many topics. Uh, the way I like to think about this is, is Twitter, which, which doesn't actually use the MQTT protocol, but a lot of people understand it. Uh, so if I, Mike Leatham, had a Twitter handle, which I don't, in fact, and let's say you, you cared what I decided to eat for breakfast, and I tweeted, oh, I had eggs for breakfast. For all of you subscribed to the Mike Leatham channel, you could see that, oh, look, Mike had eggs for breakfast. And so that could be, you know, I'm sure that thousands of people would be subscribed to my Twitter handle if, if they were interested. Um, but that's kind of how MQTT works. So th there's some pretty interesting things that can be set up through a variety of publications, subscriptions, topics, subtopics. Uh, so Kevin, can you tell us a little bit about how the wizard platform works and what that's all about? Sure. <clears throat> so the wizard platform kind of uh, came from, we saw the need out there for a way to cost effectively add sensing to a lot of systems that in the past were either done manually or that were control systems up and running but needed extra I.O. for uh, like maintenance monitoring and preventative maintenance uh, for extra performance monitoring for extra quality control um, or productivity measures um, places where you needed to add either you know a an extra temperature here or there to monitor the temperature of a of like bearings or motors or to monitor like the power consumption on an individual machine level or even an individual motor level um, to get better efficiencies there. Um, places where there may or may not be a control system in place, but it's not economically feasible to go in or it may not even be technically possible to go in and modify <clears throat> that PLC to add extra I.O. Um, or to add a PLC where you have to go in and change you know, programming, uh, timing, everything else just to add some of that ancillary I.O. Um, and, that, and those extra sensors. Um, so we thought that that had to be non-invasive, which means uh, the approach that we took was to make that wireless. Um, and if you're going to go wireless, really, you lose some of the advantage of wireless if you have to run power out there. So um, all of our nodes are battery powered as well. Um, and what this means is that it's also incrementally scalable. So you can start with two or three measurement points, um, add on nodes that talk back to the gateway, and Basically, then you can you can keep adding on without really having to go in and change that basic real-time local control system. Um, so to do that, we create a wireless mesh. Um, it's a 2.4 gigahertz, and it is based on the Smart Mesh IP wireless technology from Linear Technology. Uh, it was formerly known as Dust. Um, and it is self-forming and self-healing, uh, which basically means you know you bring those nodes in the vicinity of each other, 
they all act as repeaters, so you don't have to add a infrastructure in there other than the gateway. Um, it changes frequency on the fly, so it changes channels. You don't have to go in and do like a site survey to pick a best channel. And if the environment changes, uh, it will automatically detect the next best channel um, and change with it. So if your RF environment, you know, if you add new things, if you add other Wi-Fi, if you add uh, you know, anything like that, it will automatically switch over to the best channel. It will also automatically select the best path. So since they all act as repeaters, um, as long as there is more than one path from any node back to the gateway, um, you actually get, with the retries and everything, you get 99.999% uh, .99 data reliability on it. So we think it's an extremely resilient, reliable, rugged uh, type wireless network um, and a way to bring in a lot of sensors that you wouldn't normally get. Um, we do have it in wide temperature range. Um, we do offer it with the, <clears throat> the gateway as either cellular or as a wired ethernet to get back to, in this case, KEP server. And we do offer it in an IP67 version. It is also a UL class one div two. Um, so we think it's a great way to add sensing in places where maybe it wasn't cost effective or even technically feasible before. Kevin, let's just pause for a second. We've got a couple of questions coming through um, that I'd like to make sure we touch on. Uh, so, Gonzalo, uh, you're asking about MQTT security. Um, we'll touch on that during the demo. Um, as I configure KEP server, I'll show you some of the security options. Kind of the general answer is it's, you know, it supports all of kind of the modern, typical web security type uh, ideas of TLS encryption and certificate exchange, but we'll touch on that during the demo. And then we've got a couple questions uh, from Alan that I'm going to bounce your way, Kevin. What is the process of adding nodes beyond the kit? And can you see or monitor the network nodes via some web application in terms of the frequencies used and the status of the network? Yep. So we uh, the answer is a little bit different now and a month from now. Um, so I'll answer for the month from now, since that's probably what we'd be going forward with. Uh, what we did, we came out with a new management platform um, that completely encompasses and does all of the management for the wizard nodes. Um, so right now it is cloud-based. It will also be served up right from the, from the gateway itself. But essentially, to add a node, um, all you need to do is to go into the management platform to click to turn on, uh, search for a new node. Um, you basically wake up the node by a push button. Um, the network will find the node. And essentially, you just say, yes, that's the one I want. Click the checkbox and turn back off the searching for new nodes. Um, and some of that happens automatically also if you forget. Um, but essentially, so for as far as forming the network is concerned, adding a new node um, is fairly simple. You don't have to remember any kind of join keys, any network IDs, uh, we automatically assign a random network ID and join key so that the network remains secure. And everything on that wireless network is encrypted as well. Great, thanks, Kevin. Uh, David, we're gonna answer your question here very shortly in the presentation. Um, I'll, I'll throw it out so everybody knows what that question is. And the question is, will data be available in the network gateway uh, to both OPC as well as kind of traditional MQTT, you know, web, web type of 
uh, applications like Azure, for example? Uh, and the answer is absolutely, and uh, we'll take a look at that architecture here shortly. All right, so Kevin, you want to touch on? Yeah, the so the one other thing that I wanted to introduce um, is that we, to make this even easier, uh, what we decided to do was to do some basic starter kits uh, that would include a wireless sensor node, the gateway, um, any cable harnesses and application specific sensors that you would need, um, and then we embedded a Node-RED dashboard. Um, I won't get into Node-RED too much here, but you can kind of look that up. It's a it's a simple uh, graphical interface way to program um, to do scripting. Um, so we do a very simple dashboard for a few applications, and so that you can take these take this kit go out to, you know, if some frontline manager has an idea that they could save money if they monitored, you know, a, a temperature here or a, you know, their HVAC system, um, you can install this. One node in the kit would monitor basically one asset, um, but you could prove out exactly what your usage is on that asset or prove out that ROI for a fairly low cost. We tried to price these below $1,000 so that, um, you know, we kind of found that that's, that's the cutoff for where frontline managers have, uh, you know, authority to spend without having to go through a lot of corporate approval. So um, we kind of set it at that point. And then from there, because it's easy to add the nodes, um, as you go forward with more of a Kepware OPC server, um, you can add those add those extra nodes very easily um, to other machines in the area. You can, you know, put in whatever parameters you want and start sorting them out however you want as more of a pilot without a lot of engineering investment. Um, and then, you know, as you move even forward, um, you can expand across, you know, the whole facility, the whole the whole enterprise. Um, so it's very incremental. There aren't huge expenditures in planning of a whole plant-wide rollout. You know, at the beginning, you can actually add as long as the nodes are within sight of each other, or as long as you can put them in with inside of a new gateway. Um, this is an easy. We tried to make it as easy as we can to prove out the ROI on it and expand accordingly. Great. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, I've got another tech question here um, on the nodes. So how can you separate multiple networks, zone coverage, or individual area monitoring? I, I think okay. what, yeah, I, yeah, I think we're asking is kind of how how can I segregate from a an IP standpoint? Yeah, so um, from an IP standpoint, it would take down at the edge, it would take extra gateways, so any one gateway would have its own IP address. Um, the So each grouping would be on a separate, so each gateway would support its own wireless mesh network. Um, so the IP address is actually assigned at the gateway level for the new ones. Hopefully that. Yeah, I, th I think kind that of answers it. W William, does that uh, does that answer your question? I'll give him a minute to type into the question pane here. Yeah. Okay, perfect. All right, so I think we're through all of our questions. Let's uh, let's keep moving here. Uh, so let's let's talk about this in practice. So we've we've seen. We know what MQTT does, and we've seen how the wizard platform works. Um, now let's see how how this all starts to come together in industrial automation. Uh, so, you know, as as we've talked about, MQTT is great. We can submit data directly to the cloud. Uh, so that might be through 
you know, BNB has a, a vendor specific platform that might be to Azure, might be to AWS. Um, and it's nice because, you know, we touched on this earlier. This is a really lightweight protocol. There's a lot of protocols that involve a lot of startup overhead, if you will. You know, every time I'm reestablishing a connection, I have to do a fair amount of back and forth to to get the connection going. This is really low bandwidth, and so it's it's great for sending just a couple of data values without swamping a network. Now let's talk about why or how I might bring this into Kep Server uh, in order to use this data besides just sending it to the cloud. So by adding Kep Server into the mix, this is going to allow us to bring it into a traditional OPC SCADA system. So I could, for example, create a, a bridge into my traditional system. So as Kevin was alluding to, a lot of time the use case for this is I have an installed base already. I have machines that are you know, several hundred thousand dollars or even several million dollars. They're installed. They work great. They already have lots of their own automation and probably lots of their own sensors already. But I'm coming in after the fact. I've decided, oh, hey, you know, it would be great for maintenance type monitoring uh, or performance. Or maybe I want to do an engineering experiment to evaluate a specific process. I can come on next to that historically installed base and tack this on really easily. But with the addition of Kep Server, I can now pull that data directly into my traditional SCADA system so that I don't have to, if I want the data in my SCADA system, I don't have to send it out to a cloud interface and then bring it back down into my SCADA system. Um, and one of the kind of neat applications of this is I could create real-time logic from this. So for example, if I had you know, some bearing that was failing and I had a vibration sensor that reached, you know, past some sort of threshold, uh, I could then uh, turn that machine off or set it up for preventative maintenance to maybe swap out that bearing. Uh, all right, let's see, I've got a few more questions here. Um, so where are you storing the data? Um, that, that's a little bit of a loaded question. Uh, so there, there are multiple ways to deal with, with this data. Um, you could write it off. You know, it, it's, I guess it's up to you to configure that is, uh, is the short answer. And, and Kevin, I'll, I'll let you speak specifically to the, uh, the BNB platform because that there may be something that I'm not aware of. But generally speaking, I'm going to get this data from the uh, sub or sorry from the broker, and then it's up to me to, for example, write that off to a uh, a database or perhaps an OPC historian. OPC in general is very much a real time system. It does not on its own store any data. And the reason for that is that often OPC systems are set up with hundreds of thousands of updates per second um, and without a purpose built like an OPC historian. Uh, data store, it gets very difficult to manage that data. Uh, and Kevin, is, is, did you want to add anything there? Um, really done on the edge part, the gateway would hold its publishes until the broker was available. Um, as far as that kind of flow goes, um, you can also set up, uh, because we have Node-RED that runs in the gateway, um, you can use that to either store locally, which um, could mean either in the internal flash or you can add an external USB stick. Um, or you could actually even send that to any kind of cloud storage as well. Um, I know that wouldn't be probably a typical use, but um, but if you were interested in that down on the edge, that would be your options. 
All right, a few more questions we'll touch on here. Um, what, one sort of housekeeping one, how, how can I see questions and answer from other participants? Um, any questions that we see uh, that, you know, feel like it makes sense to talk to the entire uh, audience, we speak to those um, or, or answer them um, to the entire audience. We will also, after the fact, review these questions and if there's some good ones that we feel like everybody would probably want to know about, uh, we will send out some answers to all of the participants. Uh, let's see, we've got a few other questions. So is a cloud IoT provider required or can you just use Capware? Um, if, if your use case is to get this into uh, an OPC SCADA slash MES type system, uh, you can directly bring this into Cap Server uh, and into your OPC system. Um, a question on an OPC historian. Um, so something like Pi uh, or Wonderware also has an enterprise uh, historian. There, there are several out there, um, but OSI Pi and Wonderware are kind of two of the most commonly used ones. And let's see. Are we using Sparkplug? All right, Adam is a, a big... Uh, MQTT guy and he knows about Sparkplug. Uh, yeah, so uh, Tom just answered for us, uh, currently no. Um, so that's something we discussed and you know it's potential future addition, um, but Cap Server is currently not supporting Sparkplug. Uh, is there any plans on the uh, BNB side to do anything with Sparkplug, Kevin? Yeah, right now it's using our own JSON over the MQTT, um, and that's what the driver supports in the in the CAP server. Um, we will be implementing Sparkplug. We just have not set it quite as high a priority since we do work with uh, CAP server and some others directly without Sparkplug. Um, it uh, is moving to the top, but is not in there yet. Yeah, and and, and Kep, we're sort of in the same place that uh, you know we're we're hearing rumblings of Sparkplug, but we're not seeing that many people using it yet. So it's kind of on the list, but but not hasn't made the uh, top of the list. Uh, let's see. Will we show real configuration of Kep driver? Absolutely. We're gonna roll into a demo here very shortly. Um, Alan's asking if we're using FFT locally. Uh, so are you doing any edge analytics in your platform, Kevin? Yeah, right now, no. Um, the So the wireless network that we use to get that kind of reliability is fairly low bandwidth. So it... Um, for us to do the FFT, it would have to be right down in the node. Uh, we've taken a look at what we can do to move to that, but we don't have a project outlined for it. What we've found is that uh, as long as you're measuring in a couple of different directions, the absolute magnitude is a good warning that somebody needs to come take a look at the, uh, at the machine. Um, but we have not put a full frequency analysis into down at the node yet. Uh, let's see. And Peter from Denmark is asking us, uh, how many sensors can you connect to each gateway? Okay, that number will be, again, that's a different answer between now and a month from now, but um, when we roll out with the new ones, currently it is 32 nodes per gateway, and each node has uh, three to four sensors on it. And when we roll out the uh, new version in about a month, that will be up to 100 nodes, uh, again, with... Um, that one has a couple of nodes with a little higher I.O. count with some temperatures and analogs and stuff. So um, hopefully that's clear enough. But it, it's about three to four I.O. per node, and it's 32 nodes right now and 100 nodes eventually here. 
Yeah, so that kind of leads into we've got kind of a couple of architecture type questions. Um, one of them specifically saying, okay, if I've got a couple hundred machines in one production facility, and let's say three or four parameters each, what what might that architecture look like in terms of kind of number of nodes and number of gateways? Yeah, so as long as they're those machines are within about uh, about a hundred meters of each other indoors, that would be very solid. Um, for all the nodes to be able to connect together, and you could put, you know, 100 of the machines on one on one um, gateway, and 100 of the machines on another gateway. Um, or if they're farther apart, you may have to divide them into smaller groups with more gateways. And those gateways can all report directly to the KEP server um, and be separated out. So all of those will have separate topics. Uh, over the MQTT, um, you can add. He'll show you in the demo that you can add labels to the to any of those so that you know exactly which machine, which I/O point uh, it's coming in when you change those into uh, into tags. All right, we've got lots of great questions coming in. Uh, so, is MQTT five supported? Um, the answer from the Kep server side is not yet. So, your um, support. 3.1 and 3.1.1, um, 5, I, I know that spec is out. We don't yet support that. Uh, Kevin? That's correct for us, too. Okay. Um, let's see. We've got another architecture question um, about how MQTT and these sensors might work in an example of wind farm scenario. Uh, so, uh, Kevin, I guess I'll let you answer sort of the sensor side, what might typically be used, and then I can talk to kind of the OPC architecture side. Yep. Um, so in a wind farm, as long as uh, – in a wind farm, we may not quite have the distance. Um, we would usually go between 300 and 500 meters outdoors as long as the antennas were um, all vertical and um, you know, above the earth. So uh, you may have enough spacing to pick them all up and go to one gateway. Uh, also depends on how much you're monitoring at the base of the, you know, or on the wind farm stuff itself. So if you form a whole network on each one, you may want a gateway at each one. Um, so I'd have to see for sure exactly how far apart they are and which which ones we would, you know, what you're trying to measure at each one. Yeah, and kind of on the sort of the data aggregation and OPC side of that, um, we see a lot of that with KEP server customers. Uh, and the way that typically works is there will be a local OPC server that is aggregating the data at a single site. And then typically, there's going to be a regional SCADA that's monitoring everything. And so typically, that's going to use an OPC UA tunnel that's going to allow um, a remote instance of KEP server to securely gather all the data from multiple sites. Uh, all right. I'm just trying to uh, t pick up a couple different questions here. So timestamps. Uh, Kevin, do you guys natively add any uh, timestamps to your data? Yes, all of the data is timestamped. Okay, so the gateway is time aware. Um, so yeah. in, in answer to your question, Janice, uh, the, that timestamp you'll see in the demo will come across as a data point um, in the JSON payload, and then you could choose to do what, what you will uh, with, with that timestamp. Uh, let's see, are topics configured on each node or all the nodes can be directly configured from the gateway itself? Uh, right now we have a predefined topic space. Um, so we publish exactly what our MQTT format is and what topics we do and what everything fits in there. Yes, um, we'll see in the demo kind of that yeah. sort of the default topic setup. Um, 
uh, and my understanding, Kevin, is so there's each sensor or, or each node, if you will, has has its a default topic, and then we aggregate those topics through a gateway. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. So each node will ad identify itself in the topics, um, and then have. Well, you'll see it when you do the demo button. <laughs> yeah. Um, and do any of those nodes support individual, like, alternative 24-volt sensors? Uh, they do. They all support a uh, – let's see again. Uh, so they all take – if you do need to power them, they do take 10 to 30-volt DC for the node itself. Um, and all of the analog sensors support both a either a zero to five volt, zero to ten volt, or a four to twenty milliamp input. Um, so it doesn't supply the four to twenty milliamp current, um, but it, you can put a power supply in to supply that current and um, and to power the node. So any standard sensor will go to it. It just may have to be powered. Great. Um, and one last question here from Alan. Uh, do you have some resources that can help with a site study? And that kind of goes into kind of the sales model for um, for B and B. Uh, we can, but it does not take an extensive site survey. Um, so we do have application engineers uh, that can come visit, um, depending on the, you know, exactly where we've got um, a, a couple of system integrators that are trained and available for it too, um, that are nationwide in the in the U.S. right now. Um, um, but the intent behind this is to make it as simple as possible without having to do a lot of frequency measurements and stuff. So a site survey is essentially a physical thing, uh, making sure you've got line of sight between each of the spaces um, and that the distance isn't great. We've also built into our cloud tool, our, our device management tool, uh, the ability to, to see exactly how each node is performing, whether it sees two good parents on the way back to the gateway uh, and things like that. So we try to provide as much self-help as we can. Nice. All right, I want to uh, keep moving here. I want to make sure we have plenty of time for the demo. Um, I will come yep. back to There's a few more questions starting to come in here, but I'd like to keep us keep us on track here. So I'm sure a lot of you have uh, other obligations after the hour. Um, so let's look briefly um, at at the architecture. We've, we've kind of hit on this for the most part. You know, we might have a legacy piece of equipment, um, at you know the base that we're trying to monitor, we've discussed that. That's going to go up through this uh, wizard gateway, um, and it is that gateway that is publishing the the data, and that can be published um, up to you know a variety of different cloud instances. But we can also bring that data directly into Kep Server, and therefore any OPC. Uh, SCADA, MES, et cetera. Um, you know, there's some kind of questions on architecture, on exactly how that's working. Fundamentally, Kepware is just subscribing to that broker just like a cloud instance would be. Uh, so it looks the same, and that's the reason that you can easily go to Kep Server as well as a cloud instance uh, because of what we talked about with MQTT and the ability for multiple subscribers to subscribe to the same topic or multiple topics. All right, let's 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 get into the good stuff. Um, so I'm going to drag Kepware over onto my other screen here. So for those of you that are um, unfamiliar, this is what KepServer looks like. Uh, on the left-hand side here, we have a connectivity tree. Um, I'm going to go through what it, kind of from scratch here what it would take to create uh, an instance here. So I'm going to create a new channel. And this channel really defines the language that we're speaking. I, I mentioned at the very beginning that 
really what Cap Server does is a translator. So the first thing we want to do is establish what protocol or language we're speaking. So here's a big list of all of those, and we're going to scroll down until we get to the MQTT client driver. Um, the reason we call it a client driver is it's acting as a client to the server or broker. Um, I, I will lack creativity here and leave this called channel one. A um, couple data management things I'm going to skip past. Okay, so here's, you know, starts to get a little bit interesting here. So this is the actual broker that we're connecting to. So this is the IP address of that broker. Um, the default port for MQTT is 1883, but that, that could conceivably be changed. Um, and we have we had some security questions as well. Um, you know, am I going to encrypt this or not um, using SSL? Um, and then am I going to manage certificates? I'm going to leave this, this guy wide open for now um, just so we don't have any, any issues swapping certificates. But like I said, MQTT standard pretty much uh, works with all of the kind of modern modern uh, internet security with with encryption and certificate exchange. Uh, just some timing things here that I'm, I'm going to skip past these defaults. Uh, and then this is one unique uh, thing about MQTT. Uh, per the spec, each client to the broker requires a unique client ID. Um, this is auto-generated in, in Cap Server, and, and you can change it. Um, it's just something to keep in mind that if you start to create some of these client IDs on your own and you have multiple connections, it's possible for you to run into collisions um, if you have repeats of the same client ID into one broker. Uh, and then one more, uh, one more security piece, you, you can require uh, authentication with username and password uh, into the, the server or broker. Um, so here we just see a summary of, of everything we just set up there. Um, and I'm going to click finish. Uh, and now let's look at the one that we we actually configured here for BNB. Um, so let's see. Uh, okay, so this is that. Sorry, I'm at the device level. I'll, I'll talk about that in just a second. Let me look at the channel level. All right, so here's all of those things we just configured. Got the timing. Um, now we've got the the connection piece. You know, so where is it going? Um, and then the authentication piece and the client ID. And then the next thing we can do is add a device. Um, the device in this particular protocol is much less interesting. This is really an organizational kind of thing. So I might, for example, um, name these based on certain pieces of equipment, for example. Um, and again, there's a few little timing things in here, but it's mostly for, for housekeeping and organization. So now let's go in and look at this one that's actually configured. So what I have here is those numbers, this is the default for a BNB device. Uh, it uses it, the MAC address of the actual sensor. And then on that sensor, uh, there are a number of different data points. And so the way this works in practice is there's a JSON payload. So the first tag that I might add um, is the payload tag. And if I just do pound payload with this topic, I'm going to get a string value, and we'll take a look at the actual value of this in a minute here, of everything in that JSON payload. So this is what tells me what's there and helps me add these tags individually. I should also tell you that uh, we are presently working on and in an upcoming release, um, you won't have to add these manually. We'll have what's called ATG or automatic tag generation. Um, and you should be able to implement ATG. You click a button and it will pre-populate um, all these tags for you. Um, so we've got three different uh, three different nodes here set up. Um, I'll look fairly similar here with with different pieces of data on them. Let's now take a look at this data. So part of Kep Server is this built-in client um, called the Quick Client. Um, I've got 
mine already open over here on my other screen, so I'm going to bring it over. Um, so we see a very similar tree over here. And what we have is all of that those data tags that we were just looking at. So if we look, I'm going to open this guy up so you can see this string from the payload tag. So we have all three payload tags from three different sensors and all of the associated data. So for those of you familiar with JSON, um, that this may look fairly familiar to you. We've got an opening curly brace. Um, comma separated data is, is typical in, in JSON. And so what we've got here is, you know, so let's pick something out here. So we've got this thing called JD with a value of 25.1. And you can see down here, we've broken out that specific data point uh, with 25.1. So you're seeing a couple of things change here on the screen. So we're just subscribed to the broker. And as updates come through that broker or server, we receive the updates. And so you can see all of this data uh, is, is being fed through. You can see over here, we've got the OPC timestamp. Um, this uh, may, may help answer or may further confuse uh, a previous question from Janice, I think it was, uh, relative to timing. So you can see that we are typically going to have time coming in uh, from that particular sensor. Uh, and Kevin, when, how is that timestamp assigned relative to when a measurement is taken? Yeah, so that's assigned right at the node when the measurement's taken. Okay, and so... So, and that's in that uh, data.t. And so there's some... Um, there can be some confusion here. So, for example, so this is that timing of when the sensor actually took the measurement and then this OPC timestamp is going to be when it comes into the OPC server. So there may be a disconnect there. So depending on how accurate that timing needs to be, that's an important thing to keep tabs on. Uh, all right. And so I think that is just about all for the demo. Um, we've got a couple of questions here that are worth talking touching on. Um, so a question, Kepwer is talking to the cloud, not the gateway. And the answer to that is no. Um, it, it is in fact talking directly to the gateway. So in the case of the BNB platform, that gateway has a built-in broker. Uh, there are other scenarios where you may need to bring a broker into uh, the architecture, but BNB has a broker built right into that gateway. So the typical architecture is that CAP server is installed locally uh, in, in the facility. So it's on the same uh, network. And that's how you'd be hitting that broker. And then if you wanted to hit cloud connectivity, um, you can also do that either directly to the broker or there's means of doing that through CAP server as well. Um, and another question for you, Kevin, uh, does the network gateway support GSM GPRS provisioning? Uh, it does, it does fall back to GSM GPRS. Okay, great. Uh, so that is all we've got for the demo. Um, we'll, uh, stay online here for a few minutes and just touch on, um, a couple of kind of housekeeping things if folks have um, further questions. So we've got a, a bunch of contact information here. I'm not going to go through all of this, um, you know, for both BNB and Kepware, as you might imagine, we all have lots of ways to get in touch with us, um, both on the web as well as phone. Um, Again, you'll get PDF decks of all of this, so uh, you don't need to scramble too much here to uh, to do screen captures of this. And here's the BNB information. Similarly, uh, and we've got about another minute here. Let me just see if there's any. Uh, let's see. 
another great timing question. Um, is it possible to sync the gateway with an NTP server, Kevin? Yes. Okay, great. Um, you just set that up. If you if you don't set up one, it is pointed at ours, I believe. But um, but yes, it will automatically sync up. And uh, and Adam, your your question about how we get a dev kit, um, I'm sure that Paul, uh, the director of sales, would be tickled to uh, you receive an email from you with that question. <laughs> if there's a different yep. answer to that, Kevin, uh, by all means. <laughs> nope. So yeah, so so Paul Kutch, uh is his emails right there, um, and I'm I'm also would be shocked if you can't pretty uh, readily discover a sales email on the BNB website. But uh, yep. if you email Paul directly, he could hook you up, Adam. So we're gonna wrap up today. Um, it is the top of the hour. I want to thank everybody for joining us. Um, I appreciate it, and we will be sending out the. Uh, presentation via PDF very shortly. And that's it. I hope everybody has a great day. Thanks a lot. Thank you, everybody.